Hello and welcome to Eplumasum's Fireside Chats. Not as good as FDR's, but hey, it's something. So, there's really not much to say in the intro of this video because there's nothing really big going on at the moment. I will say that it's episode 60. Hooray! 60 episodes of the show. What'll I do for 100? I don't know. We'll find out when I get to 100. Hmm. And. Maybe I can use this time to briefly rant about the fact that I haven't had an interview in a million years. Maybe I'll get one in the future. I, I mean, I would hold more interviews, but a lot more people schedule, you know, me going... Like they schedule with me to do something, and then nothing comes. So, that's pretty much all I got to say for the intro. Let's just... Let's get right into the news. So first, here's arguably a big news story. Gravel says he has reached donor threshold for primary debates. Former Senator Mike Gravel, Democrat from Alaska, announced Friday that he had reached the donor threshold to appear in the Democratic primary debates later this month in Detroit, though he's still below the polling threshold for the debates. Gravel's campaign said it received donations from 65,000 unique donors, reaching the threshold set by the Democratic National Committee. However, Gravel has not polled at 1% or above in three DNC-approved polls to other debate qualification. So yeah, as the article points out, you know, the, like, pretty much how the debates work is, so, it's something that everybody, that most progressive news media seems to kind of forget, but... The Democratic debates have multiple criteria. The 65,000 donor threshold is just one of the criteria. It's not the single criteria to get in the debate. So remember, here are the debate rules for the first two debates. And when I say first two debates, I mean the first four, because technically, you know, the two-night thing that the debates do, 10 candidates one night, 10 candidates the other night. So anyways, the rules are as follows. In order to qualify for the debates, you need 65,000 individual donors or meet 1% in three national polls that the Democratic Party has officially stated that they approve of. Like, for example, like Emerson College, Gravel constantly points at polls at 1%, but he doesn't, those don't count. Those, those ones don't count. I don't entirely know why, but those polls just don't count. And... If there are 20, if more than 20 candidates qualify, because they're only allowing 20, the ones who meet both criteria automatically get a seat on the debate. Then, the ones who only meet the polling criteria get a seat at the debate. Then, lastly, if there are any seats left, then people who only meet the criteria of donors get to be on the debate. And, unfortunately, Gravel included, that makes 21 people who meet at least one of the qualifications. So it's very unlikely that Gravel will be going on the debate stage anytime soon. It was worth a shot, but, I mean, it's probably not going to happen. The Gravel teens have pretty much stated that the campaign has kind of winded down <laughs> they're planning to drop out in like like around the 16th i mean okay i mean i guess the them meeting the donor criteria means that they're gonna stick around just a little bit longer at least until they can guarantee something will come out of them you know raising this money like i mean they're not just going to just drop it out of the blue with all this, uh, with 65,000 donors. They're going to at least fight to get a town hall. Like, they're at least going to try for that. Because, again, they're not going to make the debate stage. But it's highly unlikely that they will get on the debate stage or get a town hall. Because here's the thing. Why didn't they do it for Moulton, Messam, Bullock... Or Gravel in the first debates. Why didn't they give them a town hall after that? To give their own answers to the questions. Because, you know, I mean, you could argue, well, I mean, technically, none of them qualified. Well, actually, technically, 
Bullock qualified to an extent for the first debates because it was this whole debacle over the fact that, oh, there was one poll where he was, you know, polling at this much, but it didn't necessarily count because his name had to be, because his name wasn't an option originally in the poll, so it didn't count. And, well, it's pretty much it in that regard. Best of luck to whatever the Gravel teens or Gravel do next. I mean, Gravel's probably just going to die soon. I mean, he's 89. He, he, his campaign was pretty much like just the teens going at it on his Twitter. It was pretty much what Gravel's whole campaign was. He was trying to... I mean, the only thing Gravel really did for his campaign was shoot an ad. And that's pretty much it. And maybe do interviews. But anyways, let's move on to the next story. H. Ross Perot... Texas billionaire who ran twice for president dies at 89. He rose from depression era poverty to become one of the country's richest men and founder of computer services giant EDS. H. Ross Perot, computer services pioneer who's outside, whose two outsider presidential campaigns tapped into some of the anti-establishment sentiments that would later propel Donald Trump to the White House, died Tuesday in his home at Dallas. He was 89 years old and had leukemia. Mr. Perot, who founded Electronic Data Systems Corp. and is sold to General Motors in 1984 for $2.5 billion, was the most successful independent presidential campaign at his time. And, well, they're right. <laughs> he was really impactful in a lot of regards. For starters, he... Like, for starters, his presidential campaign was... Like, this first one was... Uh, anti-establishment, you know, centrist type individual. His campaign, like his political positions were kind of all over the place in a lot of regards. He had some positions that would arguably be more left, some positions that would arguably be more right, and, you know, a lot of things. But his biggest thing, like his two biggest things that he wanted to do was establish electronic direct democracy so that people could actually have a say in their political sphere. And on the other end, he was strongly, strongly, strongly against the North America Free Trade Agreement. <laughs> he even described it pretty much, he literally described it as a giant sucking sound to Mexico. Because that's what NAFTA did. And I mean... It's true. It's 100% true. If you look at the numbers, NAFTA made people lose like a million jobs. We've lost like millions of jobs due to NAFTA. And lo and behold, I mean, when you're right on an issue, <laughs> you, you, you get to have bragging rights. And he did. And he did really well. He got like 18.9% of the popular vote. I mean, he didn't get any electoral votes. But he got 18.9% of the popular vote. <laughs> That's like way more successful than any third party presidential candidate. He was the he was the only candidate that was a minor party candidate that got to be on the debate stage with both a Democrat and a Republican. John B. Anderson got to debate Ronald Reagan, but he didn't get to debate Jimmy Carter because Jimmy Carter was a coward. <laughs> That's pretty much all there is on that. I mean, Jimmy Carter, it is true. He, Jimmy Carter chickened out, and Reagan took the time to actually try to make it into a political stunt of his. I mean, I fully would have 100% supported Reagan's political stunt. Like, he was literally going to have him and John B. Anderson, they were going to have chairs, obviously, so they could sit down at, one po at points in the debate where they weren't going to be talking. But he actually wanted to set up so that Jimmy Carter would have a chair and it would be empty throughout the entire campaign. Like, I mean, not the campaign, but like the entire debate. So everybody would know that he's not there. And I mean, the polls did I mean, J John B. Anderson, he didn't even do that well on the polls after that debate. <laughs> so... I mean, Jimmy felt that he was going to be, like, he was going to ruin my chances, but in fact, him actually not being in the debate kind of made him look worse, because he's like, why wouldn't you just debate this dude? Are you scared? It made him look scared. But anyways, 
Russ Perot was also a good... He was also an advocate for veterans and gave Bernie Sanders a freaking sword. Like, he literally gave a sword. Like, an actual killing sword weapon. It's like Austin Peterson with that George Washington gun all over again. But yeah, Ross Perot, he was an interesting guy. And, well, stinks that he died. And now, focusing on the Senate. It's about the Kentucky Senate race against Mitch McConnell, or as I like to call him, Bitch McConnell. Kentucky makeover, Amy McGrath. Amy McGrath has announced that she's going to be running a campaign against Mitch McConnell. For those who don't know who she is, she ran a campaign in Kentucky District 6 during the 2018 midterms. And was kind of running to be kind of like an Ojeda style populist. But not entirely. <laughs> you know, Ojeda at least made some progressive strides in some regards. But Amy McGrath is... Well, I mean... Let, let's explain. Let's hear your thing. Amy McGrath challenges Mitch McConnell as a pro-Trump Democrat. Democrat Amy McGrath tried to make a new ally on Tuesday morning as she returned to Kentucky politics to challenge Republican Senator Mitch McConnell to the 2020 election. McConnell, she said, has prevented Donald Trump from accomplishing much of his agenda during his first two and a half years in office. If you think about why Kentucky's, Kentuckians voted for Trump, they wanted to drain the swamp. And Trump said that he was going to do that, McGrath said during the announcement of her candidacy on MSNBC's Morning Joe. Trump promised to bring back jobs. He promised to lower drug prices for so many Kentuckians. And that is very important. And you know what? Who stops them along the way? Who stops the president from doing these things? Mitch McConnell. And I think that it's very important, and that's going to be my message, that the things Kentuckians voted for Trump are not being done. He's not able to get it done because of Senator Mitch McConnell. What? Are you serious? That is... You're an idiot. You're a moron. You must have literally gotten a brain transplant two seconds ago because there is literally no way any sane person would believe any of the insane, inane garbage you are espousing, Amy. For starters... McConnell votes with Trump 94% of the time. Yeah, it just so happens that the 6% is all the good things Trump wanted to do. It's all the good, amazing, wonderful things. Trump actually secretly proposed a universal health care system bill. And surprisingly, Mitch McConnell was just like, Nah, I'm just not going to vote for that one. I know I, I pretty much suck Trump's dick every day, but this one I'm not going to do it for. And it's, it's, it's funny. Like, Amy, run as an Ojeda-style populist, not a corporate sellout who is going to do Trump's bidding. Because a good majority of the people who voted Trump in the first time know now that he is a fraud. Call him out as a fraud. Richard Ojeda was in the same boat. He voted for Donald Trump. And he's acknowledging, I voted for Trump for these reasons. He was going to bring the jobs back. He was going to help the people. He was going to drain the swamp. And Trump lied to me. Run with that. Don't run with... Oh, I, I would have voted for Brett Kavanaugh. Yes, she, she did say that she was going to vote for Brett Kavanaugh. And then the next day... I mean, not even the next day. The next couple of fucking hours, she was like, Oh, wait, I changed my mind. Amy, your campaign has failed before it began. Like, I mean... I mean, I guess I might as well mention that Steve Cox is also a candidate who is at least running with the populist rhetoric. You could make arguments like, oh, maybe he's not as progressive as you say. There's this Twitter account. Every time I mention Steve Cox on my Twitter, I always get like a tweet by at I vote in Kentucky who explains like a lot of things that might be a little iffy. You know, like he expressed like, like they said like, oh, well, he's expressed pro-life stances. 
he's, I mean, and I'm like, well, I mean, he went in DMs we exchanged. He's pretty much said, like, he's personally pro-life, but he's not going to use the pro-life. Like, he's not going to ban abortion. It's it's like the Richard O'Jenna style stuff. Like, personally, due to their religious background and the deep red status of their state, they're pro-life because of the Christianity and blah, blah, blah. And then they're not really going to, except for these guys are at least acknowledging, like, well, I mean, we can't just say no, no more abortion ever. We can do other things to try and extend and make abortion less frequent, but it's not going to be, you know, just abortion, no, no, and then just <laughs> have it be done in back alleys. Speaking of the Senate, I, 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 don't, I don't have a story for this because I didn't feel like the story itself was necessary because I can just sum it up in a picture. I don't, I mean, you're not going to see the picture because, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to give you that, but there's... This list, like, many people are, like, because, you know, in 2020, there's going to be a lot of Senate seats up for grabs. I think a good majority of the Senate seats are up for grabs. I think it's 32. 32? Maybe. I don't know. Probably not. Probably. No. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much a lot. A lot of Senate seats are up for grabs in 2020. And... There's a lot of speculation and stuff on which seats are going to flip, which seats are going to stay what they are. And uh, the Washington Post posted an article that stated the top 10 most likely flips in the 2020 Senate elections. And here's what they have. Texas flipping from red to blue. Colorado flipping from red to blue. Arizona flipping from red to blue, Iowa flipping from red to blue, Georgia flipping from red to blue, North Carolina flipping from red to blue, Maine flipping from red to blue, New Hampshire flipping from blue to red, Michigan flipping from blue to red, and Alabama flipping from blue to red. And they give reasons for many of these states flipping, you know, unpopularity with the senators or... Uh, various changing demographics in the states. Like, for Texas, they say that the Beto O'Rourke campaign was, I guess, a good stepping point for a Democrat to actually take Texas. North Carolina, I kind of believe, because, I mean, I mean, to an extent, it's kind of believable, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's, like, 100% or anything. Like, none of these are 100%, except for Alabama. I 100% I believe Alabama's going to be turning back red pretty soon. It is. There's just there's just no question about it. It's flipping, and whoever is going to... It's going to be a Republican that's going to take the seat again. It'll be Roy Moore, or it'll be someone else. Whoever. I don't know who it'll be, but a Republican's going to be the next senator. Doug Jones is not going to get a full term. I mean, for North Carolina, it's kind of... I mean, and I mean, to be fair, like... I'm not supporting anybody in the North Carolina Senate race because nobody's sold themselves to me yet. I mean, all we got running are blue dogs. And, like, one guy who ran for mayor one time. But that's pretty much it. I wanted Cecil Bothwell to run, but he won't. So, yeah. I guess it's pretty much all that for that. Now, this one, I don't necessarily have a specific article, but it's kind of a developing story, if you will. Okay, so for starters, this is, again, a developing story. So, let me explain the whole context of the story. It all begins with Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi criticizes the squad, you know... Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and Ayanna Presley. She criticizes them because she's like, well, I mean, who really cares about them because they only got four votes. And they clapped back and criticized her for a lot of things. And then, at one point, there was a meeting where she openly said, like, Democrats on Twitter, stop calling each other out. This is stupid. If you have anybody to complain about, complain to, be, complain to me. Come directly to me for, my critici for the criticisms. Don't at them on Twitter and don't call them out by name because we need party unity. 
despite the fact that she's like, the squad is stupid, the stupid progressives and blah, 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 blah. Progressives are dumb, losers stupid. And then the Black Caucus decided to jump in on this craze and insinuate Justice Democrats as racist because they were like, hmm, you seem to be targeting Hakeem Jeffries, a black man. Hmm, this is strange. Why would a progressive organization be primarying members of the Black Caucus? Are you guys secret racists? Hmm. And then they were like, um, actually, you guys supported um, Mike Campuano against Ayanna Presley. So why did you do that? Oh, we and they're like, oh, we don't, we don't actually endorse just black candidates. We endorse candidates, like we endorse incumbents and black candidates. And that immediately made people go, hold on, like, like that's all we needed to hear. You said that you supported incumbents. AOC's um, advisor got called out by the House Democrats' t- official Twitter because, you know, he insinuated Sharice Davids was racist because she voted for a bill that would pretty much guarantee nothing for the... Um, like the kids in detention centers. And then it turns out that Nancy Pelosi wasn't even talking about the Justice Democrats entirely. She was also talking about Mark Pecan. Because Mark Pecan pretty much said, when did the Problem Solvers Caucus turn to the Child Abuse Caucus? And she's like, no, we need plenty of unity. And it's just... Uh, the only way I can describe it is... Literally, this is the only way I can describe the whole controversy about Nancy Pelosi and uh, the every and the progressives. At least to put it in YouTube terms, David Pakman saying on Twitter, not on Twitter, like saying on his YouTube channel, like we need to stop breaking down the left with all these like progressives against David Pakman and Sam Cedar, and then like two days later made a video saying that Jimmy Dore is pretty much the equivalent of Dave Rubin. <sighs> I mean, like, it's, it's fucking stupid. Like, Nancy Pelosi is always like, We need party unity! We need party unity! We need party unity! While saying, Fuck the progressives. And it's... I, it, it, I always bring this attention to everybody... Everybody I talk to who talks about, like, the reforming the Democratic Party and all this stuff, it's strange because it's, like, progressives, they do everything for her. They voted overwhelmingly for Pago. They voted overwhelmingly for Nancy Pelosi for Speaker. Literally no progressive voted against her for Speakership in the last Speakership election. Well, I mean, maybe one of them voted against her on the secret ballot, but they didn't make it known. Like, they overwhelmingly go behind Nancy Pelosi and do everything for her. And they get nothing. They get nothing. They say, we'll support your rules package. We'll support you for speaker. Nancy's like, oh yeah, that rules package will handicap Medicare for all for the short term, and it probably won't happen in the 116th Congress ever. We'll hold like a hearing about it to make it seem like we actually care about it, but otherwise it's not really going anywhere. But they're like, okay. Okay, can you at least hold hearings on like the Green New Deal? Because this is a very extensive environmental crisis going on, and we need to fix this. Uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not gonna do that because, I mean, eh, I'm not. Okay, ooh, how about this? We can fight overwhelmingly hard to get children at the border safe, like, we can, we can guarantee them better conditions at the very least, because I know we probably won't be able to get them free, but we'll be able to at least get them better conditions because we have the majority in the house we can overturn we can end this bill and, we, and then even if the senate overrides it and does something in it we, we, we will at least show that we're united as a party and no 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 i'm not i'm not doing i'm not doing that either i'm i'm not gonna do that at all meanwhile the moderates will try to take over her position as head of the house democrats a la Tim Ryan, 
vote against her to try and be leader of the House Democrats, a la Robert Francis O'Rourke. When she's trying to show party unity, they will vote against her for speaker, a la Jared Golden. But she always does what they want because at the end of the day, the, mo- the moderates, the blue dogs, they can just flip from D to R any day. Whereas Mark Buchan, AOC, Rashida Tlaib, Tulsi Gabbard, they have nowhere to go. They can either try making it as an independent like Bernie did, but it's very unlikely that's going to happen. They can try to run as a Green Party candidate, but it ain't going to happen. She knows that she has their hands tied. She can do whatever the hell she wants to them because they won't fight back. That's why a progressive needs to challenge her for a speaker, and not only that, he or she needs to get other progressives to openly say, I will back you for speaker, not Nancy Pelosi. Picture this. Picture a scenario, like, let's say in the 117th Congress, Ro Khanna announces that he's going to be challenging Nancy Pelosi for Speaker of the House, and all of the House progressives, you know, Raul Grijalva, AOC, Tulsi Gabbard, Peter Welch, all these guys announce that they're going to be backing him, and then they form a progressive block so that they know, like, we are going to be supporting him for Speaker, not you, Nancy. You don't have the votes to be Speaker, so... We're, and they even openly say that they're going to support it for speaker in the general. Like, I mean, not in the general election, but like, when it's time to actually cast their vote, they will not vote for her for speaker. She will then be either just not run for speaker or be forced to change her views. That at the end of the day will be better than anything. But anyways... Now let's move on to 2020 watch because we actually got something interesting. Eric Swalwell dropped out. Wait, 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 wait. So you're telling me that the candidate that said he liked the smell of his daughter's shitty diapers didn't do so well? (laughs) You'll have me flabbergasted. You'll have me completely floored. And at the end of the day, it makes sense that he <laughs> would drop out because his campaign has gone nowhere. I mean, granted, he got on the debate stage. I'll give him that. I'm surprised Moulton and, you know, Messam are still in the race. Okay, to be fair, I'm not entirely... Like, M- Moulton, I understand why he's in the race, but we'll get to that when we get to that. I mean, at a different day. we will probably be a fully edited video or something. But anyways... Him doing that, him dropping out, is pretty much inevitable. He'll try to make a run for his house seat again, even though he should pass the torch. He should pass the torch. Inevitably, nobody gave a shit about Swalwell to begin with, so why anybody should start caring now? But anyways, there's another candidate that has actually entered the race. Pro-impeachment billionaire Tom Steyer makes a late entry in the Democratic race. No. No, no, nope, don't care. I don't care about Tom Steyer. I really don't. He's a billionaire who's like, I'll fix the problems because I'm rich. Shut up. No. No. (laughs) I mean, and I'm reading this, it's like, he's like, nobody owns me. I'm not afraid to speak my mind. I'm not beholden to them. I'm not beholden to the establishment. That's what Trump said. Because they're like, I'm a billionaire. I I have my own money. I don't need my special interests. Oh yeah, Tom, you also are just like that. You're literally trying to be a left-wing Donald Trump. And that's not going to work in this regard. Because you don't actually have... You don't have the issues. You don't have the policy. You don't have the backbone. You don't have the guts to do it. All you are is a... Like, literally, here's what many people have been trying to do. They're trying to 
the the Democratic Party, to an extent, has been trying to make a left-wing Trump, but not in the way that it would actually work. They want a left-wing Trump, as in a billionaire turned presidential candidate, or a celebrity turned presidential candidate, trying to get the likes of Oprah Winfrey to run. It's terrible. Like, like why? Why? It's stupid. If Tom really wanted to run for something, he should have run for something less. Like, that's the thing about a lot of these cats. Run for something less that you could win. Like, Molten. Like, I mean, I don't want Molten to run for Massachusetts senator, but if he ran for Massachusetts senator, he's at least have a chance of winning. And that would be, like, a thing about Moulton. Like, Moulton's known for, like, primarying progressive old people. It's kind of what him and Swalwa have in common. Progressive old person? No, you gotta pass on the torch to this young, moderate man. Anyways. That's pretty much all i got to say about these two things. Now let's get into the smaller candidate of the day. The smaller candidate of the day is Brian T. Carroll... He is running with the Christian Democratic Party called the American Solidarity Party. I've discussed them before, but if you don't know what that is, it's pretty much like, you know how libertarians define themselves as like, on the social issues, I'm left, and on the economic issues, I'm right? Well, flip that for the American Solidarity Party. They're right wing on a lot of social issues, but they're left wing on a lot of economic issues. You know, like, universal health care. Ending the wars, ending abortion, you know, that kind of stuff. Mostly, like, 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 a thing, again, it's like, they're right-wing on a lot of social issues, and they're left-wing on a lot of economic issues, and it's pretty much their shtick, and that's pretty much how Christian democracy works. I explained this in a video that I've done in the past about Christian democracy, but again, it's like it's it's pretty basic stuff, and I guess they could technically appeal to more people that are like that, like people that might be a little more hesitant to say like I'm pro-abortion, but would probably be more likely to support a Bernie Sanders-style economic platform. Like my mother is, you know. She's, like, more conservative on a lot of social issues, you know, like, at the very least on abortion, but she's, like, when she hears, like, Bernie Sanders say, like, oh, we need to guarantee health care to every human as a right, or Tulsi Gabbard say, I think we need to end the U.S.'s regime change wars, or even Andrew Yang saying, like, I support a universal basic income, she's like, yeah, that, that, that's good. So, Brian T. Carroll, I mean, I'm not entirely sure if he'll get the nomination because, you know, there's Joe Schreier and he's like a perennial candidate, so he might do well. But Brian T. Carroll's like been a longtime member, and unless Mike Matern runs again, it's very likely that he will probably get the nomination. But I don't know. I don't know much about the American Solidarity Party. So, anyways, speaking of third parties. Now let's move on to the main topic of this video, one that I actually kind of decided the very last minute. What the heck is going on with the Constitution Party? For those who don't know, the Constitution Party, previously known as the U.S. Taxpayers Party, is a national political party in the United States. It is well known for being right-wing to far-right in the political spectrum, having more Christian right-wing paleoconservative, socially conservative, fiscally conservative views. To an extent, they consider themselves like the ideological home of the Tea Party. They've had a lot of interesting regards to third-party politics, like they tried to get Pat Buchanan to run for their presidential nomination in 1996. They tried to get um, Roy Moore to run for their presidential nomination in 2012. I didn't mention this in my Constitution Party video because I didn't do the, that much research. I'll probably include it in my screw-ups list. But they've 
really been kind of there in regards to third parties. And Tom Tecrendo is someone who ran with them and got like second place, I think. As you can see, it's the, it's the, and here's the thing, it's the third largest third party. You know, it's like Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Greens, Constitution Party. So they're the fifth largest political party overall. They're, like, always there. Their electoral wings, like most other third parties, have kind of been stagnant. They currently have 26 elected officials. I mean, as far as, like, as far as Wikipedia says, they have, like, 26 elected officials. And, like, again, they're pretty much, like, like with the Tea Party, pretty much all of the Tea Partiers, if, even if they were more ideologically at home with the Constitution Party, they would probably run as Republicans just because, you know, if you want to run, why try to make it harder for yourself? Why not, to, why not actually try to win? Some notable figures in the Constitution Party are Howard Phillips, who was the founder. Um, Virgil Good, who was a former representative who ran for their nomination in 2012 and was their nominee. Tom Tecrendo ran for the gubernatorial nomination in 2010 and was actually the second best candidate. Like, he, he pulled the... He pulled the best, um, like, I mean, it was Hickenlooper, then him, then the Republican. So, he, he did well. Now, why am I talking about the Constitution Party? Well, you see, I might be having to make an update on the Constitution Party video because the Constitution Party is having a bit of trouble. Here's what happened. The chairman of the Constitution Party... Frank Flukajir is currently having some trouble keeping his party together. Many state affiliates, like the Constitution Party of Virginia, have announced that they will be leaving the party due to a long-standing controversy. Let me explain what the controversy kind of begins with. Now, the Constitution Party of South Dakota was kind of fracturing with who was the true leader of the cuz cuz the thing about the constitution party is that it, its state affiliates always kind of have some kind of independence in some regard like you know state parties usually have some kind of independence but due to the fact that the constitution party is kind of more you know conservative in its ideology and more you know localized in a lot of its government reforms it's it like like the constitution, like it, it, it's it's usually the thing with paleo conservative parties. They usually kind of fracture off and form little groups. I mean, not saying left wing parties don't do it as well, but you know the constitution party kind of and other paleo conservative parties they kind of do it a whole lot more, in my opinion. Like the American Independent Party, which at briefly at one point was just the California affiliate of the constitution party, coincidentally. Like I mean, anyways. Terry LaFleur, that I think I'm pronouncing that right, was one of the candidates of the Constitution Party for South Dakota who tried to be their gubernatorial candidate. Now, he was supported by one faction, and there was another candidate by the name of Laura Hubel, who was the candidate of the other faction. I believe that she is the... She was the one supported by the, like, the establishment of the party? I believe she was, because I think Terry, like, she has a Wikipedia page, and she used to be a Republican state official, so I think she was the one supported by the establishment, because, you know, you know, if you're a major party candidate, and you go to a smaller party, you might actually win something, maybe. And Terry was just kind of the Constitution Party supporter. And he kind of sued because his faction wanted to be the Constitution Party of South Dakota. Frank, of course, 
responds like, hey, they're just trying to throw me over. They're trying to give me a coup. And, you know, it doesn't really... I mean, yeah, I guess technically they are, but, I mean, maybe you should listen to a bit more of your party. They might actually have some points that they might want to give you. So, they've kind of been... Like, I mean, the... the and each state affiliate of the Constitution Party has kind of been making their own choices in regards to this, again, due to their more localized ideology. So many state factions have actually chosen to just leave the Constitution Party and become their own political party. Not even just, like... Like, they're, they're still going to be the Constitution Party, but they're going to be, like, a just a state party as opposed to affiliated with the actual Constitution Party, which is troublesome because, I mean, if all of, let's say hypothetically, all of them do it, well, then there is no National Constitution Party. It is very troublesome for those who are affiliated with the Constitution Party. They might actually have to end up making a choice on who do they support in this endeavor, do they support the Constitution Party itself, or do they support more of its members? Do they support, like, a member of the party, or do they support the party itself? Like, even it's getting to the point where some prominent members are actually speaking out. And by some, I mean one. The only prominent member that I know so far that has actually spoken about this in regards to actually being opposed to Flukajer is J.R. Myers. J.R. Myers has ran for multiple offices under the Constitution Party or Alaskan Independence Party, which is, I think, the state affiliate banner. He's run. He's a perennial candidate. He's actually decided to openly leave and resign from the Constitution Party and form his own political party called the Life and Liberty Party, which is pretty much just the Constitution Party, but without the Constitution Party name. So... What are my initial thoughts on this? Well, it's kind of good and it's kind of bad. Good in the sense that I don't want the Constitution Party to exist because I don't like its ideology. But bad in regards to the Constitution Party. Like, the Constitution Party is a prominent third party. And it being disillusioned could be troublesome, especially in regards to, you know, actually doing something prominent. Like, for example, it, as far as I know, is the only major third party, as in a third party that's in a lot of states and not just a couple, that is actually yet to file a presidential candidate. One person was close and was technically on his way to do so, but he didn't. It was Bill Bays of the Prohibition Party who tried to run as the Constitution Party candidate, but inevitably didn't pan out. So, will this be an end to the Constitution Party? Maybe nationally. Locally, I don't think so. Because I've actually been looking into some other aspects of the Constitution Party, especially in North Carolina, because here's the thing about North Carolina. North Carolina, again, it's a swing state, so it's important. So, here's one thing about the Constitution Party that is kind of a gleam of hope for any constitutionalists out there. While the National Party may be gone, your state affiliate might be sticking around. Because here's the thing, like, let's look at North Carolina. North Carolina is, of course, just usually, usually with North Carolina, it's got, like, the Democrats and the Republicans and unaffiliateds, and then there's, like, one or two third parties. Well, not only did the Constitution Party get major party status in the swing state in 2017 or 2018, it is currently running a candidate in a very high-profile North Carolina race. Um, it's District 
3 is the one that it's running in. And it's gotten, like, some news coverage, and especially in District 3, where the race is. And Greg Holt has been kind of... been He's been in the news a lot. Like, usually they don't even acknowledge third parties, but I remember, like, there's actually this, like, TV spot that's, like... It's, like, they're down to five candidates... Two Republicans, one Democrat, one Libertarian, and one Constitutionalist. Who will win? We're going to interview all five candidates. And, like, the Constitution Party doesn't normally get that. So, it's inevitably good for them in that regard. And, it even got to the point where the Constitution Party is actually now the fifth largest voter registration in North Carolina. Voter registration in North Carolina is Democrats, unaffiliated, me, Republicans, Libertarians, Constitution Party, and the Green Party. So, yeah. The Constitution Party may be disillusioned at the national level, but on the local level, Constitution Party is probably going to be sticking around for just a little bit longer, at least in some regard. I know I kind of... I know if you're a Constitution Party activist out there and you're watching this and you're actually following this controversy with a magnifying glass, you're probably looking at me like, ugh, this is terrible. This is a terrible summarization. Well, then, you can come on my show and you can explain this situation because, again, the Constitution Party is kind of the political party that I know kind of less about. So, yeah, that's probably all I got to say about that, so... To all you constitutionalists out there, good luck in some regard. Let's see if your party sticks around. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report.